this week on Arts Insight. The Lost Spirits. Kids were asked to draw a butterfly, to create some sort of butterfly that they could commemorate to a in art hand in hand. I'm always looking at the ground and I'm always finding something. Oh, look at this. Glass molding artisans. The spontaneity of the material really lends itself to the fluidity of being creative in the moment. And that's what really drew me into working with glass. And it's a glittering world. Jewelry is a very significant part of Navajo culture. I'm Ernie Manoose, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. We're at the Music Box Theater. It's part live music and part comedy. And in just a bit, we'll find out how they're celebrating their fifth anniversary. But first up, children are experiencing a profound connection to the past through handmade butterflies. The artwork is poignant and tangible, a creative way to express the enormity of lost lives. The butterflies really embody transformation. and transcendence. Through this project, you feel that. The poem by Pavel Friedman called The Butterfly inspired us to create a lesson plan that we took to schools starting here in the Houston area and then eventually worldwide that gave the kids an opportunity to identify with the loss of 1.5 million children that perished during the Holocaust. Kids were asked to draw a butterfly, to create some sort of butterfly that they could commemorate to a child lost in the Holocaust. And they would hang these delicate, fragile, beautiful butterflies, and they'd hang them from their classroom ceiling. Kids would come into their classroom. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was delicate. It was just as, as amazing as any butterfly would be. And the teacher would come in one day, and she would randomly cut down their butterfly. And this, you can imagine, made children upset, saddened, angry. Why'd you cut down my butterfly? Well, the truth is, there was no reason. There was no reason the children of the Holocaust perished as well. So that lesson connected the kids of today to the children of the Holocaust. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. About 11 years ago, when the Holocaust Museum Houston was celebrating its 10th anniversary, I interviewed my mother for the project I was looking through photos of hers, old photos, and I found for the very first time a picture of her little sister, and she was in a butterfly costume. She perished upon arrival in Auschwitz. That has been chilling to me ever since. My father was a survivor to me like no other. For me as his daughter, to watch how someone can overcome so much and, and, and still be hopeful about the world that we live in. Um, I was always in awe of that. These butterflies came to us from all over the world. Um, with the exception of one continent, Antarctica, we received them from everywhere. And we created an exhibit in our museum um, for people to see. And we started a uh, traveling exhibit, which many Houstonians can now see here in Houston uh, at Two Allen Center. We have a wonderful exhibit that's going to be here for three months. Butterflies are made of all media, wire, fabric, glass, metal, paper, origami, crochet, needlepoint. Needle point. There also are fragments of poems, the poems that were written in Theresienstadt on some of these butterflies, as well as some of the names of the children who perished at this time. Each one speaks to you differently. Some are funny, 
some are sweet, and some just tug at your heartstrings. There's six exhibits that'll be traveling throughout the community, and just seeing one isn't enough. You really want to see all the different cases. In just a short few years, we won't have any Holocaust survivors that can actually go into the schools, go out into the community and talk about their experiences. And so it's up to us, second generation, third generation, to carry on their message of hope. If we leave no other message than hope for tomorrow through this project, then, then we've won. Butterfly Project can go on and on and it will continue to resonate with children of tomorrow as well. See more at butterflies.hmh.org. We're here at the Music Box Theater, where for the last five years they have been a beacon of cabaret theater right here in Houston. And who better to tell us all about it than Rebecca Dahl. Hello, Rebecca. Hi, Ernie. Okay, this dream of yours, five years along now. It's happened. Five years. That's what they say. You know, if you can go five years in a business, then you're not dead yet. Yeah, dead Which yet. is good. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what you bring to the Houston scene. Well, we saw that there was a, a niche missing in terms of cabaret theater every weekend in Houston. I mean, we've got a lot of theater and we don't have cabaret. Now, I, I am reticent to use the word cabaret because, right. you know, <laughs> in the South, sometimes they tend to associate that with people being topless, and we are fully clothed here at the Music Box <laughs> Theater. But the essential definition of cabaret is lots and lots of music interspersed with light banter or comedy, and what we do is kind of our own brand of that since we're kind of um, idiots in a sense. <laughs> We love to have fun. It's kind of a throwback to like the old Carol Burnett variety shows on television or the Dean Martin variety shows. It's kind of that type of energy. Yeah. And we love it. It's like having a party every weekend. When you started five years ago, what were you hoping to accomplish? We were hoping to accomplish, well, we were acting in musical theater, um, all of us, and my husband and I, you know, we wanted to start a family and we wanted to have a little bit more control over our personal time and what we wanted to do, but we also just wanted to have more fun. <laughs> you wanted to have time over your time. <laughs> well, control over our time. and also, So you open a theater. Yeah. That's a smart move. But we can bring our kid here, and he loves it. He loves the band. He loves everybody here. We've become a family, so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And if we were still doing musicals downtown, there's no way they'd tolerate my two and a half year old <laughs> running around or, or Kay's dog or Christine and Luke's dog, you know, and so it's 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 laid back yeah. theater here. Some of the high points, some of the things you accomplished that really stand out for you. Well, the Houston Press gave us uh, Best Cabaret this year in Houston, and they created a whole category for us. <laughs> that category never existed before, so that was kind of an honor. It's like, oh, they created a category so they could give us an award. But um, mostly just that, that uh, we've created a place where people can come, and all kinds of people, it, you know. Our audience consists of women who love musical theater downtown, but they can also bring their husbands who aren't musical theater fans and just want to hear some good rock and roll and have a, a bucket of beer, you know, and a few laughs. And, you know, we serve beer and wine. It's very casual. We know, like, 75% of our audience, we know their names. We know where they like to sit, what they like to drink. And it's, like, it's essentially like having a party uh, twice a week, three times a week, and um, with really, really great music and lots of laughs. And for people to understand, you folks do a show. You put together a show, it runs for a period of time, and then you put on a new show after that. Right. We run each show about five to six weeks before we change it up. We want to give everyone a chance to see it. And each show has a, a theme, and then within that theme, tons of different kinds of music from across the decades. We do a Broadway-themed show every year. We do... At the holidays, we do a Beatles holiday show, so it's Beatles music and holiday music, which you think wouldn't work, but it really does, and people <laughs> love it. In the summertime, we do a 60s, 70s, like Woodstock theme, so um, the themes vary, the music varies, um, but it's always us being silly and cracking each other up, and it's a different show every night. We improvise, we, we write scripts. Uh, sometimes we just do concert shows, it's just music, and then we do our sketch comedy shows where we write a script, but we change it up on the fly, and uh, we crack each other up, and. Um, it's really super fun. I hope you guys come. For your five-year anniversary, anything planned for this year? We're doing a five-year anniversary show. Oh, my. That's I a know. It's a smart. It's a smart idea. <laughs> 
we've actually let our VIP customers choose the song. So we sent out a survey to like, we have a hundred VIP customers, which just means they get special treatment when they come, they're regulars, they get the table they want, they get a bottle of wine when they come, but um, they also get to pick the songs for our next show. So we did a survey, we gave them choices. We have over 500 songs in our catalog now. It, that means we've done 500 arrangements in, um, of our own, and our, we have this amazing band with our, our leader, Glenn Sharp, um, and we help, we all collaborate on the arrangements, we all collaborate on the writing, but we have over 500 songs in our catalog now, and so we let the uh, VIPs choose which songs they want in that two-hour show, which is going to be just a celebration concert show where everybody gets to hear the best of the music box. It's well, we look really forward great. to you folks getting to 1,000 songs in your rep, and onward Your mouth that. to God's ears, all right? <laughs> Rebecca, thank you so much. A thank pleasure, you. as always. Thank you. The Music Box special anniversary show runs through June 18th, so you can still catch it. Find out more at themusicboxtheater.com. Up next, a sculptor is repurposing discarded objects in unique, surprising ways. I asked myself many times, where would I have gone if I had not gone into the arts? And I think I would have gone into dark matter. I probably would have been a juvenile delinquent. When it comes right down to it, I had a high school teacher that saved my life. But he took my energy and channeled it and showed me how to channel it. And I asked him, you know, which direction should I go or give me a sense of direction? And he looked at me and he said, you know, just be who you are. I decided I was going to have fun. And if I can't have fun making my art, then I won't do it. And I still have fun to this day. And that's one of the reasons why I make the pieces that I do. Everything that I use in my work is recycled. And I use everyday objects, spoons, handles, handles that I've worked on, all this stuff, stuff that I've used. It could be legs to an animal. And I have to work with the material that I'm familiar with. Sheet metal, and screws, and wood. I'm always looking at the ground, and I'm always finding something. Oh, look at this. And it really has to catch my eye. When I find an object, I already have in my mind where it's gonna go. And it's a feeling, really. It's kind of a feeling that it belongs in that specific area. Got some map pieces. These are all salmon beads for salmon lures. And this is stripped uh, copper wire. And there are all these little entities in there, word sayings and little scribbles. So they can look at the work and say, what is that? Well, it's a guitar. Oh, yeah, it is a guitar. Well, there's the frets. Then you can kind of like piece the piece it together about what the imagery means and what it is. And I'd like to take those materials out of its natural dwelling and having it become something else. It has a lot to do with using those objects in, you know, as a spiritual sort of uh, element. The respect of the planet, not being a throwaway society. I love the outdoors. I love animals. I fish all of the time. And I have a lot of respect for Mother Nature, especially the endangered species. We have a, a, a white owl, or it's a tundra owl. They're endangered. I have Ed the armadillo. And a porcupine, California porcupine. This is a great horned owl. He's got eyes behind his head like most owls do. My wife and I get a big kick out of watching birds and animals. They're, they're very humorous. And the little antics and stunts that they do just brought out something that maybe I could relate to and convey a message about, oh, you like this too. And this is my night heron. And his eyes move to uh, reflect his attitude. Us group of artists are just kind of in a niche all of our own. We'll give you the pointer. Art's only 10%, the rest, 90% is hard work. And I'm not afraid of hard work and I enjoy it. It's a means to an end for me. My life is a very physical life and I enjoy that. I like being active. I like working on my art. It gives me a sense of, of security. It gives me a sense of who I am 
and a direction, and I need that very much so, like most artists. You know, I do it because I love it. You can find out more by visiting richardfees.com. Up next, at the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan, a glass blowing shop uses old school techniques to recreate early American glassware. I got started in glass blowing through college. I went to the College for Creative Studies in downtown Detroit, and while I was there, I was kind of an undecided student and fell into a glass blowing class and changed my major right then and there. The spontaneity of the material really lends itself to the fluidity of being creative in the moment. And that's what really drew me into working with glass. What we do here is we create early American historical recreations. And what we do is we'll pull from our collection of early American uh, glassware and we will take it and reproduce it for the visiting public. You can make glass that is an art or glass that is functional. And so it really relies on the artist's you know, skill and the artist's you know, conceptual framework. We are here as our own artists. You know, we are ourselves. This is what we do year round, uh, full-time jobs. And we're here to convey the artistry of glass blowing and give people a sense of the history of it as well. Traditionally, it was uh, a very regimented factory setting. So you'd have teams of workers you know, creating glass at different benches, all working on the same piece. So one team would be starting it, one team would be finishing it, and you would be working full production nonstop. So what happened in the late 60s, early 70s, was what's called the studio glass movement. And it was really the change in direction for private artists to get into glass making. And it became a smaller scale, working in private studios, making artwork more than just traditional functional work. What we're working on is what's called the lily pad pitcher. It's an early American design from uh, produced about 1835 to 1850 in New York. And it was traditionally one of the first uh, American designs that came truly from America. Historically, what would happen was the glass makers would come from other countries and they would bring them with them their own designs. And so having a piece that was really reflective of the early American time period uh, made us really want to try to capture that essence. What we do is the same traditional techniques that really came about in 50 BC when the Phoenicians invented glass blowing. All the tools are pretty much exactly the same. They kind of got them right, right out of the box, but we will use the same traditional techniques, just modern technology to fuel our furnaces. The process of making glass starts with the melting of the silica sand. Once that is melted for about 24 hours, we'll take that and we will gather it out of the furnace at about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. After that, we will take it and shape it, blow it, and then we will flip it around and do the finishing work on the open side. We work in teams of two generally. There's what is called a gaffer or the main glass blower and his assistant. And so what we'll do is the assistant will bring over additional portions of glass called gathers and the gaffer will take those and manipulate them using the various tools. Within the process, it's not just glass blowing. That's what everyone thinks. You know, when they come here, they want to see us actually blowing into the blowpipe. And that is actually a small portion of what we do. The majority of it is based on using tools to manipulate the glass. Since the glass is so hot at 2,000 degrees, we can't touch it with our hands. So we use different tools. Um, there's jacks, there's diamond shears, tweezers, all these variety of tools that'll help us shape and manipulate the glass. Depending on the thickness of the material, uh, the glass will cool down anywhere from about 30 to 60 seconds to where we can no longer use it. It's still uh, well over 1,000 degrees, but it's cold enough that we can't shape and manipulate it. So what we'll do is we'll put it back into a reheating furnace every so often to heat it back up, make it more malleable, and allow us to continue working. Depending on the complexity of the piece, we'll work anywhere from 15 minutes to over an hour. It makes it uh, very challenging. Um, the more years you do it, the, the more efficient you get at working, but in the beginning it becomes very difficult to manage your, your time well. 
And so, you know, you have to really be planning and thinking ahead. When we're completed, uh, the glass blowing process, we will take it and we will break it off of the punty rod and we will uh, put it into one of our annealing ovens. It's basically a big electric kiln and it's set at 900 degrees. At the end of the day, we will run a computer program that will slowly cool it down about 50 degrees an hour. We've recently expanded our product line from not only historical recreations to more of contemporary designs that we have based on our uh, collection, but we've taken them and added more of a modern twist. Within this shop, we do have quite a, a range of uh, skill levels. So we have people who have been working with glass for close to 20 years, and people who have been working with glass for just a couple of years. I think that people, when they come here, they're generally um, enthralled by the fact that they get to see a material that they're so used to seeing in their day-to-day -day life in a completely different state. So they're, they're amazed that the fact that on the end of a blowpipe, this molten material is actually glass. And constantly you can hear people amazed that we're cutting through it. You know, you're cutting glass with a pair of scissors. And so I think it's that, that concept that they don't really get to ever see the material that they're used to in a different state. I think it is important that we keep this tradition of handmade objects alive because for that fact that everything today is so mechanized. You, know, you can go to a store and get glasses that are made by machine for pennies on the dollar, but when you get a piece that is handmade by an artist, you really get to capture that moment when the artist was creating it. And I feel like that is what will never go away. People will always want that. For more information, visit thehenryford.org. And finally tonight, the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian oversees one of the world's largest collection of native artifacts, including a stunning exhibition of jewelry. Jewelry is a very significant part of Navajo culture. It's really a reflection and a relationship between the individual and the stone. It's a relationship with the land. It's a relationship with everything that's Navajo. is an exhibition that focuses on the brilliant work of Lee and Ray Yazzie, two very talented brothers and their family, uh, many of whom are also Navajo jewelers. There are over 300 pieces of jewelry in the exhibition. We have bracelets and squash blossom necklaces. There are rings and belt buckles. The jewelry itself, of course, is very beautiful and a lot of people appreciate it, but they don't really understand the story behind the work. So what we've tried to do is provide some cultural context as well as some historical context so that viewers can really appreciate what goes into each piece and really see the work differently. The Yazis come from a very large family. Their parents used jewelry as a means to support themselves when the children were young. Elsie worked at home making jewelry. Chi Yazi, the father, would take the work into town, into Gallup, and go to the trading post. Historically, Navajo people have only been making jewelry for about maybe a little bit over 100 years. It was introduced in the late 19th century and eventually became a really important trade item. There are also a lot of uh, photographs in the exhibition, both of Gallup as it was in the past and Gallup as it is today different scenes from um, the reservation that really give you a feel for the landscape of New Mexico and where they were raised. Lee Yazi is, is the oldest um, son in the family who is a jeweler. He is very wedded to the traditional forms. He's really taken these, these patterns and these designs to an extreme. His work is very strong in terms of light and shadow. He is really a master when it comes to working with silver in particular. He's a huge fan of turquoise, so you see that appearing quite frequently in his work. 
the blue corn bracelet is inspired by a cob of corn that he saw when he was harvesting with his mother. It's really a great example of Lee Yazzie's innovation in the field to be able to look at ordinary things around him and, and see design possibilities. Ray was very, very focused on becoming a fine jeweler and an artist from a very early age. This was something that he wanted badly and he pursued very aggressively. And his work is incredible. It's almost architectural in its form. He also incorporates gold into his work and um, very fine inlay work. Uh, he also is very fond of using many colors in his work. So there's definitely a very different aesthetic between the two brothers. Ray is really proud of the Blessings bracelet because he was really challenging himself to see how many pieces he could get into that single work. So it's really a spectacular explosion of color and form. Another artist in the family that we focus on here in the exhibition is Mary Marie Yazzie. She's the eldest daughter in the family and is really the family matriarch at this point. She herself strings beads and creates her own material. Uh, several of the women in the family are known for their fine work making Navajo silver beads, which is a very labor-intensive process, but creates some incredibly beautiful results. Well, working on this exhibition was really a privilege. I am Navajo myself, and of course, jewelry has been part of our lives um, since I can remember. So for me, this exhibition was really a great opportunity to learn myself about what contemporary Navajo artists are doing with it today and to see it as a contemporary art form, not just as something historical, but something that's really moving us into the future. For more information, check out nmai.si.edu. And that does it for this episode of Arts Insight. For all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.